Got, have we got any mothers here? Yes? Who got breakfast in bed this morning? Yes? Nobody? Who got breakfast in bed this morning and you've got to go home and face all the mess in the kitchen? And all the bits and pieces that are spread around the house and the cupboards that have been pulled out because of the, the, the fine intentions of your children. You know, Mother's Day, it's pretty commercial across the world. And uh, in, in a sense, my mum used to say every day is Mother's Day. And um, today, I'm doing the right thing, mummy. I'm wearing a tie. My mother loves it when I wear a tie. It's the only time she listens to me when I wear a tie. So Mother's Day, mothers, they're very integral to life. They're very, obviously, they're very integral to the family unit. And um, dads, we don't have it as sort of hardcore as mothers do. Mothers have got to be there for their kids 24-7. Generally speaking, I know the world's a bit different these days. But normally the mother's there with the children all the time. You know, in a sense, and I, and I say this with a greatest deal of respect, a mother has to raise their husband as well. Who would agree with me? Yeah. Oh my goodness, a whole lot of people put their hands up. Okay. You know, Prince William, he just commented recently with the, uh, the birth in England about his brother. Welcome to the Sleep Deprivation Society. And I think that uh, parents know what I'm talking about. Mothers are the most influential people on the planet. And the greatest gift that a mother can do is give herself. And uh, I want to talk to you about a mother today that is profound in scripture. I'm going to talk about the mother of Jesus and what she went through and what it was like to mother the king. And we've just uh, sang the song, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there's no doubt that she would have had uh, profound uh, misgivings and, and shortcomings when, the, when it was announced to her that, uh, that she was going to be the mother of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Saviour of the world. And that would have uh, rested on her heart. And in fact, it did. And uh, there is numerous uh, uh, scriptures talking about how she pondered internally that she understood the responsibility that she had. And I guess when we're talking to the mothers today, I want you to think about the responsibility of, of a lady who bore the Son of God and just what she went through. We're going to get you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 26. And this is a very different kind of talk from me. Normally, I'm, I try to rattle the cage a little, but this is uh, a little bit more Bruce Judkinish, if you know what I mean. Luke 1, people don't say, I don't know what you mean. But anyway, that's okay. And in the sixth month, we're in verse 26 of Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, or a messenger of God, was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And to, to a virgin, exposed to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel come in to, came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And this was the, uh, the miracle. This was the declaration from God that something very special was going to happen. And that uh, special thing that was going to happen that was she was going to bore a son and his name was Jesus. And it's interesting that uh, Mary was looked upon as being virtuous and godly. She was looked upon as being someone that could be trusted, of course, and someone to be revered. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation should be this be. Now, in the context of today's parlance, I'm pretty certain that it, according to the book of Jeff Beggs or Simon Longfield, she would have said, get serious. You've got to be kidding. I'm going to have a baby, a virgin birth. I'm espoused to a husband. I'm a good girl. I'm full of virtue. I'm a teenager. I'm, I, I'm espoused to get married to Joseph and, and I'm going to bear a child. You've got to be kidding. And it goes on here. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Well, we know what that means. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. 
Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. She must have thought that Gabriel was off his wheat fix. She must have thought, this guy's got to be joshing me. You've got to be joking. This is real. This is happening to me. Why me? What an extraordinary thing. And anyway, so she then finds solace with Elizabeth, the, the mother of uh, John the Baptist, as that com comes to fruition later on. And he, even there, there is a, 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 the baby moved in her. And that sort of, sort of clarified that something that was going on here was unbelievably profound, unbelievably special. She was a teenage girl. She was virtuous. She was chosen by God. She surrendered herself to God. And she was obedient to an uncertain future. And it's interesting, you know, down here, I'm just going to quote you a few things that are said a little bit later on. In Luke 1, 42, it says there, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And that's what Elizabeth said to her. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. In Luke 2, 10, which shall be to all people. The angels sang about the unborn child, that this was going to be a child that was, that was for everybody, not just for the mother or the father to look after. This was going to be a unique, special person. In Luke 2, verse 33, and we'll move down to there, just over the page, and it says there, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword shall pierce through his own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now this is just extraordinary. And I want you to, I, I mentioned before, and we'll go back to just verse 7 there of Luke chapter 2. And it says, and she, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. We know this story, the nativity scene. We talk about it every, every uh, Christmas time. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and singing perhaps the song we just sang. Who knows? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And we just stuck down there, verse 19. And I want you to think about this verse. It's probably a verse that is, isn't as profound as all the other verses we've read. But this is Mary. This is her dealing with something unique. This is her dealing with the fact that she was going to bear a baby. And that baby was the hope of the world. And that baby, well not as a, in the form of a baby, but was going to be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that was going to minister he was going to go out and, and spread the good news, the good tidings. And uh, I just want you to look at this verse 19. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, as a mother, I'm not a mother, but at the mothers, you know you've got the best intention for your children. You want them to be healthy. You want them to be happy. You want them to, to not struggle. You want them to grow. You want them to see, you want, them to be, you want to be proud of them. You want to be able to stand up and, and enjoy them. And it's interesting, you know, that here is Mary. She was full of all of this wonder. She's just had this unbelievable amount of uh, stuff dumped on her by Gabriel, by Elizabeth, by Simeon, by these people that, that seemed to have an inkling that something special had happened. And it says she pondered. 
that means, you know, in, in a sense, it's, it's when, in the Greek, that word means, it means you rotate, in, you churn. You know, as a parent, you've, have you ever churned in your heart? You know, you're worried about your kids, you know, whether they, when they go to school and whether they're going to get on the bus and they're going to be safe and all this sort of stuff. But Mary had this churning. And that word ponder, it's, it's not a common word in Scripture, but it's said a few times about Mary, how that she pondered and churned and had to deal with herself and had to deal with the emotion and had to deal with, with, with uh, an extraordinary outcome, a destiny that she had no control over. A destiny that was thrust upon her by God, delivered by the messenger Gabriel. And, and she was supposed to somehow do her best to bring up this young person to this greater destiny. And she wasn't really sure how it was going to play out. She didn't even understand the, 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 the Old Testament, you know, wonder when it, for unto us a child is born. She wouldn't have even probably known about that. In a context of, of Mary, you could say unto Mary, a child is born. She still had to deal with the nappies. It's an unbelievable thing when you think about it. To raise a child that has a destiny that is for all mankind. Now that is motherhood. 101 and all the people said, what an extraordinary thing. You know, it, it, and that, uh, in Luke 2.36, we'll go there. We've done that. And there was one Anna, the prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asa. She was a great age and, and she said things. And she, in verse 38, and she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in, in Jerusalem. So, so here's this stuff. Mary's got to raise a child, which is hard work anyway. And all the mothers said, no, easy. Okay, that's all right then. But here, we, here, here it is. She's stirred in our, her heart. She's, she's pondering. She's churning about why have I got this responsibility? What is this responsibility? What is it I'm supposed to do? How do you hone a human being to be the son of God? How do I bring him up in the nurture and admonition of himself? Actually, that's very relevant. That's quite smart what I just said then, because most teenagers would... Yeah, you got me there. Okay, so here it is again. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. These are the things that Mary pondered. He shall be to all people. This is what the angels were singing at the birth. What will happen to this child it will pierce like a sword, which is profound. And it says here, he came to them to bring redemption in Israel, which we've just read. And, okay, and also... Here's the clincher. We'll go back to Matthew chapter 2. And verse 13. This is Herod's on the scene there. He's not happy about what's going on. And he's in verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And be there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek to destroy the young child, to destroy him. So I read that backwards. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. We'll go back to Luke 2. Should have told you that before. So here we've got all of those profound things that, that are kind of eternal, that, that are the hope of mankind. And she, she's dealing with all of this stuff as a mother. And then Joseph walks in and says, I had a dream last night. We're going to get out of here. Otherwise, he's going to be killed. And so this is, this is full on. This is what I call parenting 101. This is, this is you've got to look after your kids. What an extraordinary story. And it says here in verse 40 of Luke chapter 2, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit with wisdom and grace, and God was upon him. And I would say that God was upon the family. That wouldn't have been an easy time. So we know that... Uh, that Jesus grew, he became wiser, and for 12 years they were in Egypt trying to just, you know, raise a child up to the age of 12. Just the onset of peer group pressure, all that kind of stuff. Dealing with Facebook, who knows? 
No, I've made that up. Okay, the first thing I want to say about Mary is she's an extraordinary lady because she embraced her role wholeheartedly even though she didn't understand the outcome. Isn't that interesting? You know, we've been born again. You know, we've been brought in to, to the understanding that we are the sons and daughters of the living God. You know, we, we come to church on Sunday, we can speak in tongues, we involve ourselves, we tell others about the Lord, we preach the gospel, we sing his praise, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the outcome, it's very blurry. We know we're going to meet the Lord in the air if we do the work, if we walk accordingly. But what does that actually mean? What does it actually mean to meet the Lord in the air? What does it mean when, when, when the word of God talks about the kingdom to come? We are in the kingdom of God now, but the kingdom of heaven, an era or a dispensation, something, are we all here or are we all over there or are we all in the same place? And it's a little bit like Mary. She'd been told all of this stuff. She had been given all this secret business to, you know, to deal with as well as be a mother. It's quite extraordinary. Now, okay, 12 years. That's what happens next. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year to the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the Jesus, Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. And they were supposing him had taken company, went to Jay's journey, and they sought him amongst their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not... They turned back to Jerusalem seeking him. Jesus had properly vanished for three days. He's gone. Mum, how do you feel about that? You know, you, you, we'd have helicopters up in the air. We'd have search parties. We'd be on it. Unbelievable. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And it says that all that heard him were astonished at his understanding. He was doing the Lord's business. He, had, he was cutting the mustard. He was actually stepping into his destiny. What's it go on here? When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother, Mary, said unto him, Son, give us a break. Why didn't you tell us where you were going? Now, what I'm saying here is that uh, maybe Jesus was pretty ordinary. You know, it's, he, you know in, in the context of telling his parents, you know, he didn't leave a note on the fridge or under the phone, sent a text message. He just vanished for three days. You know, and, and here's Mary. She's sitting there and she's, she's perplexed and they've been out. The search parties have been out all over the place. You know, they've probably got the, what, whoever out there, guards and whoever, trying to find Jesus. And in her heart, she's pondering. Is this his destiny? Is this the beginning of it? And she would have been all over the shop. You know, when I used to go missing my mum. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. She used to hope he wouldn't come back, you know. But anyway, 12 years, vanished for three days. He would he explain to God, you know, has Mary got to explain it to God? He's gone. Whatever. She would have been frantic. And this was a typical teenager, perhaps, in her eyes. And this is insolence meets destiny, perhaps. Who knows? She would have been churned. And then there's 18 years of silence. And what would have that been like to, for Mary? The son that is not truly her son. But even so, she holds to the course. Mary loved Jesus as a mother. And she nurtured his destiny. Even though it wasn't all good that she got back. Would have been an emotional roller coaster for the mother of the king. Biblical historians assume that Joseph died during this period. If so, that left Jesus as the head of the, of the family of eight. His job as the head of the family, this is in this 18 year period, is to feed, clothe, and look after everybody else. Finally, the time came when Jesus would leave home. Now, in our modern era, you don't leave home till you're 45. Or, or thereabouts, you know, you're, you're trying to push your, your adult kids out the door. Back then, in the first century Palestine, to leave home 
when you're the senior person in your family is was unheard of and here again mary had to to deal with the fact that jesus was was leaving home to go and do something that was godly yet there was no job at the end of the road there was no this he wasn't going to a set path he just left home you know it is unheard of for a man to pack up and leave his home back in that time jesus had no particular place to go he left everything behind but what did mary do she trudged behind him whilst he went about the father's business she had such a resolve because of what was said to her because of the churning of her heart and because of coming to terms with which she had born the son of god this special unique person that was going to bring something special to the world so she trudged along behind him and in a sense became a disciple and there were many things that uh that happened then we go to john chapter 2 it says here this is the uh i just want to highlight here the role of mary this is the the first miracle of cana where jesus turned the water into wine and the third day there was a marriage in cana of galilee and the mother of jesus was there interesting and both jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they wanted wine the mother of jesus said unto him they have no wine and jesus said unto her woman what have i to do with thee mine hour is not come i'm not getting into the miracles just yet his mother said unto the servants whatsoever he saith unto you do it and there were set there seven pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the jews containing two or three firkins apiece and jesus said unto them fill the water pots with water and anyway you know the story they went on and jesus turned the water into wine the interesting thing there is that mary said do this she was profound in in jesus beginning miracle she was a player and a starter in in the, this wonderful thing that continued matthew 12 verse 46 here's an instance an incident where jesus was uh in a certain place i can't remember where it is because it doesn't look the same on my bible here it is yes okay he was the pharisees he was just lecturing the pharisees he was doing parables and talking about all kinds of things and in verse 45 and when goeth he and taketh himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first even so shall it also be unto this wicked generation now while he yet talked to the people he'd been lecturing them on all kinds of things profound lectures on, on sin and iniquity and and false doctrine and all this kind of stuff and yet while he talked to the people behold his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him they just stood in the shadows this is mary this is the the mother of, of jesus and then one said unto him, behold thy mother and brethren stand without thee desiring to speak with thee and see they were trying to take a rise out of jesus for ignoring his mother and saying that your mother's over there she's not on the same page as you what about that what does jesus say it's unbelievable and jesus answered and sent unto him and told him who is my mother and who are my brethren slap poor mum she's been trudging around all over the place and he uses as an example of what's important jesus was on it he was on it not honored on it he was in the in the game and he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said behold my mother and my brethren for whosoever shall do the will of god which is in heaven the same is my mother and uh, sorry my brother and sister and mother he he used that as a moment he used that as a time where he could expound on the fact of what comes first and what really matters so here we go she loved jesus as a mother she nurtured his destiny now she's following him around the place while he's ministering you know mary saw her motherhood as a privilege she saw her role in the plan and purpose of god and defended her son all the way through see some saw jesus as crazy some saw him as dangerous particularly in government but also some actually used the phrase they saw, thought he was possessed of a devil and that was often said about him because they didn't agree with him 
Some stood and watched. She had to stand back and watch people try to kill him when he came back. And even her other sons didn't believe that he was the son of God. It really is extraordinary. It gives you a picture of, of her tenacity and what she had to deal with as a mother. You know, you think when you've got uh, you know, your kids there at home and they're flicking the porridge around the, the kitchen, you know, flinging it at each other, do you, you think you got it rough? All I'm saying is this, the, the mother here, the mother to mother the king was something extraordinary. It really was something very special. John 19 we're closing in pastor jeff but it's going to be tight john 19 and verse 19 and pilate wrote a title now we're at the time of the crucifixion and pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was jesus of nazareth the king of the jews his title then read many of the Jews for the place where, where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. We'll go down a little bit. Then the soldiers, verse 23, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every shoulder apart. We'll go over a little bit further. Now there stood by the cross his mother, Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. You would think that they could have changed their names it would have been confusing mary one two and three anyway and there's the mother of jesus she's been through a rough time it's it hasn't been easy for her and now one of the things that people say a mother's worst nightmare is to outlive your children and here she was jesus is on the cross and and what was she thinking is is this the fulfillment of the plan is this the fulfillment of, of the purpose? Is this why Gabriel spoke to me? Is this why, you know, I, I've toiled and we had to, to flee into Egypt and, and 12 years here and 18 years here and then we had the problem in the temple and this and that and this and that and so many things. And it comes down to this. It comes down to this moment. You know, I mentioned before about Simeon's swords had taken its sw a swing. Gabriel promised Jesus would rule. The angels sang glory to the highest. Mary may well have been thinking, if this is peace among men, who wants it? I want my boy back. She was a natural mother. He was born naturally from an unnatural pregnancy. It would have been a tough moment. And it's interesting there what, what transpires. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved... He said to his mother, woman, behold thy son. You know what he's saying there? It's okay. This is my destiny. This is why you've toiled. This is why it's been tough. Because this is where I'm meant to be. It really is quite extraordinary. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple in a sense, took her under her wing and looked after her. But it's not over yet. Mary was last recorded in Scripture in Acts chapter 1. And we'll go to Acts chapter 1. She saw her motherhood as a privilege. And I guess in a sense, the, the connections here today is that we are sons and daughters of the living God. We've been called and purposed and and, and God has put his love in us. We've been called with a purpose and, and we have been grafted in to God's purpose. And I guess the, the greatest story or the greatest side that I want to bring out today with Mary was that uh, not only did she have to mother in the natural sense, but she had to nurture the purpose for when she was called. She was called to give birth to the Son of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being, assembles together, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. It's all coming down now to why Jesus died. He died so that the moments that, that, that now are now coming could happen. For John, the son of Elizabeth, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. 
When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, for the power of God has put it in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to all the uttermost part of the earth. And we just duck down a little bit further. And when they were come, verse 13, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where there abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Elpheus, the, and Simon, the Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, probably the three M's, to be honest, Mary, Mary and Mary, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And so... What I want to say to you there is it doesn't mention that, uh, that she was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured, poured, poured out. But the point is, is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was now a disciple herself. And she would have received the Holy Spirit when the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound, of he- uh, sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus came. This was the fulfillment of prophecy. This was really the beginning. This was, uh, you know, we saw the last time Mary said much was to her son when he was on the cross. And it would have been a very emotional moment. She probably would have wondered what on earth is happening. But here we see in scripture... The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to die so that his mother could receive the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, you know, many people in the world say that Mary's special. Yes, she was Mary. She's very special. She was a great mother. And she took on a role that no other mother has. But some churches take it to another level. And we're not going to do that. She, she would have died, but she died in the Lord like we know. It's interesting, you know, verse 16, and this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. You know, it's often said that we can never repay our mothers for all that they do. Mary's commitment to her son and her belief in him And what he had to do was astonishing. It was amazing. She pondered, she churned, she worried, she instructed, she toiled, she encouraged, she projected, she raised, she despaired, she fed, she changed his nappies, she washed his clothes, whilst the whole time knowing that her son was destined to be the king, not a king, the king. It was a big ask, but she did it magnificently. And all the people said, let's bow in prayer.